has kept free speech alive and continues to provide low-cost access to media for the community. You are invited to join BCM on Saturday, December 6th at 2239 Martin Luther King Jr. Way for their 20th anniversary benefit. You can bring your free speech stories and a friend or two to share in the moment. For details, call 510-848-2288. We were in a room full of about maybe 17 women, all of whom had had husbands, sons, children killed by the death squads. And those death squads were, have been financed from the United States. And they told us their stories and thanked us for accompanying them. And they, they said, would you please go home and tell your people? It was the first time we were told that, but not the last time. Our system is in too many ways broken. The way we see the world shapes the way that we treat it. We gathered together a, a group of um, activists and journalists and said, okay, you know, can we do this? What will this be? Decided on the format that it wouldn't be journalist driven. Not, none of that kind of journalism. No personality driven journalism. So it wouldn't be always the same journalist. We wanted journalists from all over. And we decided it would be a 13 week experiment. And that's going on 20 years ago. <laughs> Every week since January of 1995, Making Contact has been bringing you voices and perspectives from the grassroots, analysis of the larger structures driving our global economies, and solutions being created by people all over the world. change or demanding justice with an agenda that they put on the nation's mind. We don't normally spend much time talking about ourselves, but 20 years on more than 130 radio stations is an occasion to celebrate. So this week, we're going to hear the story of Making Contact and how this little radio show became part of a new generation of media outlets that continues to both counter the mainstream and transform our conception of who and what is considered newsworthy. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is the 20th anniversary edition of Making Contact. Welcome to a new national radio program called Making Contact. Each broadcast will aim to help create connections between people, vital ideas, and important information. The first anniversary of the uprising in Chiapas was just celebrated in Mexico and abroad. In this edition of Making Contact, we explore the history of the Indian Rebellion and bring you up to date on current events. Poets and writers in San Francisco discuss media images and whether they have the power to make us sick. And Making Contact co-producer Norman Solomon gives a few of the reasons we are going to the air with this new weekly program. The new nationwide radio program you're listening to now, Making Contact, is not about conventional wisdom. And it's not dedicated to providing more of the same voices heard on the networks. Whether or not they acknowledge it, all broadcasters have values and beliefs that guide their decisions about what to put on the air, so we don't claim to be objective. We believe in human rights over corporate rights. We believe that people should be heard on the airwaves no matter how much or how little money they have. Those of us involved with the Making Contact program believe that radio can serve democratic communication rather than just broadcasting political views acceptable to the big money interests that pay the piper. Could you tell me about... The beginnings. Of and should we do the other part, too, about my name and identifying yeah, myself? Can... I can do that just a... <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, this is Norman Solomon. I'm co-founder of RootsAction.org, executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, and also coordinating IPA's new organization, ExposeFacts.org. So um, if you could tell me about the beginnings of making contact. The early... 1990s was an exciting time for radio. There was more chance through access to the NPR satellite and some other what we would now consider to be fairly rudimentary ways to distribute 
radio shows around the country and beyond, which basically had the New York Times and the Washington Post very dominant. TV still was very dominant. There was no Internet to speak of, certainly no web when uh, Clinton came into office. And so there was tremendous uh, spin coming from what we now would call the traditional or what do they even say legacy media for whatever reason the networks were powerful cbs abc nbc uh, cnn had come into its own and um, cable news was beginning to be very important and so the need for counterweight was really great norman solomon came to me with an idea, and he just wanted to talk over the idea. So, um, do you want okay, me to so do that again? Yeah, My name is Paul George. I'm director of Peninsula Peace and Justice Center, which is based in Palo Alto, California. He wanted uh, a program that would be significant for grassroots organizations. He was well aware of the uh, level of uh, activity of local groups, small groups all around the country, all around the world, that had no voice on the air. And, uh, you know, outside of their own circle, people didn't know what they were doing, didn't know their original um, and creative organizing methods and, and things like that. And in the mix of things, when we have so much amplification of the views and outlooks and perspectives of the rich and powerful, isn't it more important for us as journalists to try to widen the array of voices and information by giving more amplification to the voices of the not poor and the not powerful. Today on Making Contact, has the war on poverty become a war on the poor? A documentary on food not bombs. We've got brown rice and a white bean and vegetable stew and some salad and some black coffee and that's the kind of that's one of the smaller meals that we do on sunday we do with thoughts on the philosophy of dr king dr julianne malvo and ultimately when we talk about the civil rights struggle and ultimately when we talk about all the struggles for rights we also have to talk about economic distribution and we're uncomfortable with that because then we start hitting people where they live we start saying if you have that much this perhaps takes from someone else. We start raising the question, how many cars do you need? Does one person need? How much income must one person have? We start wondering how we make economic policy in this country. It is illegal for homeless people to sleep at night. There are totally inadequate facilities for people to fall asleep, yet they are harassed, ticketed, arrested, in effect, tortured, trying to perform the necessary functions that everyone must perform every 24 hours. And as we talk about implementing Dr. King's dream, we have to say we will not support those who do not support us. We will not buy from those who are not principal producers. That if you emit toxins, we don't want your product. That if you hire people at 425, we don't want your product. And understand that takes some personal sacrifice. Because the personal sacrifice then is that, why do you think chicken is the cheapest meat in America? Because chicken processing workers earn minimum wage. I just want to say, too, that we made a lot of food this morning, and we brought it down here, and four people have been arrested. And now they've taken her keys, and they say they're going to tow her vehicle. Food Not Bombs has bent over backwards to comply with insane regulations, even in face of the obvious fact that you do not need a permit to serve free food. For a group of individuals with no money to negotiate with the government for six years and to still continue to be beaten and arrested for their efforts is outrageous. Peggy and John were very instrumental in building a community in a community. Peggy Law is my cousin. And so I've known about making contact almost since the very beginning. Peggy and John Law. Through Peggy and John. And I knew them from other political activities. Well, as you probably have heard from other people, by sheer will, Peggy 
has driven all of us into her circle, which is ever expanding. Among us, we knew lots of people who wanted this to happen. And so we just went to them and said, can you help us raise the money to do it? And we started literally with no money. And it was everything from fundraising to media outreach to finding contributors that will also participate in helping to build stories. Who are the people that might be interested in helping to uh, do some of the production work? I'm Pam Law. I started with Making Contact in the summer of 1994 out of my parents' bedroom. And I was the first station liaison calling up random stations all over the country and telling them about Making Contact and seeing if they might like to try carrying it on their station. I would say it was a challenge to get airtime initially when we were totally unknown. But in that first summer, we got on a bunch of stations across the country. It was pretty exciting. We had this um, map on the wall, and every time a new station said that they wanted to carry making contact or at least to try it, um, sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning or something because that's all they had available, but we'd put a little push pin, you know, in the map and... Um, it was pretty fun. After we were working for a while, we had six stations uh, that were airing Making Contact. And so it was like starting from scratch. It was awkward to start with. Because sometimes there were some days when I was like, oh, I don't really want to call these people. Who knows if they're going to want to talk to me or whatever. But it actually turned out to be pretty cool because you could call somebody in some random place in Montana or Maine or something like that and a lot of times they actually wanted to hear about it and they didn't know about it and they liked the story of how it was happening and what kinds of um, shows were being produced and they were glad that I was calling you know because they're like oh we don't have anything like that or we want more like that so it was a breath of fresh air uh, because nobody was doing it nobody was paying attention to the voices and opinions of um, grassroots activists making contact filled a void of information and so it really was an experiment uh, and then the feedback was overwhelming uh, it was so good and so we just kept going there was nothing quite like what making contact became a half hour news commentary magazine you might say with a lot of reporting and grassroots progressive orientation and a willingness to take on for a full half hour one basic topic or focus. We started doing things for, because we come from a particular progressive uh, standpoint. Um, we started doing things that at that time were done by very many. It wasn't a whole lot of people critiquing capitalism, for instance. There wasn't a whole lot of people talking about um, corporate welfare. Uh, there wasn't a lot of people talking about the percentages of people who do well and not so well. Now, there are a lot of more people doing that. Now, we didn't make that happen, but Making Contact was one of the efforts that started beginning to... I can't say we changed the social dialogue, but we played our part. Radio journalism, except in public radio and community radio, has virtually disappeared except in a handful of stations in the largest markets. A town that doesn't have a community radio station is sort of like a town that doesn't have a public library or a public swimming pool or a public park. That's just one of the things that makes a democracy work. Every time we see something from the right-wing madness, there ought to be a progressive voice that stands up and speaks against it. This is our country, and it's like we have to be inspiring ourselves and those around us to really believe that and feel entitled. And I want to say that means that there will be setbacks, but we have to maintain that sense of hopefulness. Doing what's right and being punished for it is much better than spending the rest of your life in this system doing something that you found out was wrong. The teachers would always say, you know, I want three strong boys to help me carry these books over to the other room. 
And I'd always raise my hand and they'd be like, you're not a boy. And I'd be like, I know I'm not a boy, but I can carry the books too. And the day I became active was, was the day that my grandson got into the string to play that I played in as a child and my mother before me. Uh, and he said, Mama, what's wrong with these fish? And I looked down and in his two little hands, he was six years old, his two little hands, he had two handfuls of dead fish and there was dead fish laying all over the stream. And I started screaming, get out of that creek, get out of that creek, don't ever get back in that creek again. This is our graveyard here. It's where our people are buried. And uh, we need to protect this. here is to get this place to return back to the Indians where we can take care of it and we can manage it ourselves. Disappearances are among the most heinous crimes in the history of the world. Court after court after court has found that a disappearance is a crime against humanity. It can be tried anywhere, forever. It is one of the worst possible crimes because it not only hurts the detainee, it hurts the community, it hurts their family. The family never knows what happened to them. And when it said that we should go off to Vietnam to stop the spread of communism, I had been in the military now for three years, and I thought uh, this sounded good. They said our cause was noble, that we were going to be the liberators, the same language we're using, of course, today toward Iraq. And I bought into that lie and how easy it is for our leaders to take the, the lie and call it truth, to take the evil and call it good. <laughs> An enormous crime against humanity is being committed right now. And I woke up. I realized I do not want to be part of this. People are saying we have money to send folks to war, but we don't have enough money for books and schools and health services. There's definitely political motivation for people to fill low-wage jobs in this economy. And one way to do it is to push them out of school. And that's exactly what we're doing here. After paying the rent, basically, you know, you have a couple hundred bucks left, and it's like, okay, who, which is going to be the lucky bill that gets paid? You know, will it be pg e or will it be, you know, another utility or something? And so my debt are still there and just getting higher and higher because there's I have no money to pay them. Abuses are inherent to the war. You cannot have a clean war. You have to have rapings, killings, uh, torture. It's impossible. That is war. That is the meaning of war. Audio collage was put together back in 2004 by former Making Contact producer Amy Pomerlo for our 10th anniversary show. Today we're celebrating 20 years, and because of generous support from listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations across the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to donate, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. There's a line of cops poised, looking very stern, holding their batons out with uh, riot gear, helmets. There are protesters standing in front of them with... And their fingers raised in peace signs, trying to talk, and the police, you can hear, are the police officers pushing me, even though I'm with the press, with my press pass, sticking a baton in my back. The demonstrators are sitting down, linked arms, screaming the 
the whole world is watching. The police are lined up in front of them, holding their batons out in riot gear. The network news ignored the WTO meeting. No one expected anything to happen. They didn't send people out, you know, until things had, you know, really hit the fan. And then most of those reporters couldn't get in. That's Michael Eisenmenger, who helped start the first independent media center, or IMC, to cover the 1999 World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle and the massive street protest that shut down the WTO meeting. Making Contact was there in Seattle and, along with other independent media outlets, had been reporting on the WTO, IMF, and unjust international trade regulations for years. In fact, during that week in 1999, we produced a special daily series called World Trade Watch. Protesters in the streets of Seattle voiced a wide range of opinions concerning the World Trade Organization. Just a concerned citizen who's read up enough about the WTO to know that it can't go on like this, that people need to be involved. It's time that we're invited to the table. The trade is unfair. We're losing a million jobs every year because of what's going on here. American workers in the last eight years have seen their wages drop because of NAFTA. We can't have sweatshops in any country. We can't have children laboring. We have to have decent working conditions and benefits for all working people in every country in the world. Those events were a coming out party of sorts for a new generation of independent media. Aided by the internet, often decentralized and citizen or volunteer run, the conversation was changing and trickling up to the mainstream. The following two years saw increased attention being paid to multinational corporations and the unaccountable bodies that regulated them until September of 2001. You know, what really undermined the movement, both the globalization movement as well as, you know, I, I think the media activist movement that supported it was, you know, 9-11. That was the beginning of the shutdown. But rather than join the media chorus of blind patriotism, Making Contact turned our attention to the other after effects of 9-11, the loss of our civil liberties and targeting of Arabs and Muslims by law enforcement. The only reason why they really got arrested was because we're Muslim and they had long beards. If you're going to arrest someone, do it for the right reason, not for something stupid like they did with our case. We are certainly all much more vulnerable since September 11th. David Cole. And I think that that vulnerability does argue for recalibrating the balance between liberty and security. But I think we need to do it in careful ways. We need to do it in measured ways. We need to avoid symbolic responses that make us feel good but don't, in fact, actually make us safer. Following Hurricane Katrina, we stuck around long after the floodwaters had receded. And so now today you have rich developers running in and feeding off us like buzzards. Uh, and, and matter at our own mayor is sanctioning that. There are land developers on his bring New Orleans back commission that has nothing to do with bringing us back, but maybe bringing back the wealthy people. With the election of the United States' first black president, making contact stayed focused on making sure voices of dissent, calling for justice, would continue to be heard. He can't continue to promise immigrant communities that he is helping them while he's carrying out these anti-immigrant policies through programs like Secure Communities. If you believe that what Wall Street does is evil, then Obama's service to Wall Street is evil and there is nothing lesser about it. In terms of issue areas, a lot that making contact was on the cutting edge of in the mid-1990s has become mainstreamed and that's not because of the greatness of the proclivities of the mass media it's because of grassroots organizing both media and otherwise that took human rights issues uh, such as uh, gay rights poverty being challenged as an abuse of humanity uh, racism that's institutionalized often in many ways we don't see. Those are issue areas, if you will, that 20 years ago were considered more, if not fringy, at least edgy. Now it's just routine.
Protests against Wall Street are spreading today to a number of major U.S. cities, including right here in the nation's capital. This is the first big street protest to take place during the Copenhagen Climate Conference. It's been called a, a wave, a wave of hope for a flood for climate justice. Thousands of people... Commissioned by the ACLU, the new report claims widespread bias and racial profiling within the LAPD, claiming black and Hispanic residents are stopped, frisked, searched, and arrested by the LAPD far more frequently than white The residents. Associated Press, one of the most respected news outlets in the world, has now announced that they will no longer use the term illegal immigrant to describe a person. Foreign diplomats abusing workers in their homes, domestic servants forced into lives of indentured servitude, even slavery. We are dealing with our criminal justice system in our states every day and altering laws to make them more just and equal. There's an overwhelming amount of black men in prison. There is an education to prison pipeline that is profitable in this nation that is run by corporate um, entities that are making money on putting black great, boys great in jail. Speech. The top 1% not only ran away with the prize economically in the last 30 years, but also took, took the power, manipulated it, twisted it, broke the law, brought the world economy to its knees, actually, and it's time to correct things. The substance of uh, what Making Contact and some uh, relatively few national and other progressive media outlets, what we were doing in the mid-1990s has been recognized uh, as irrefutable, you know, again, the rights of immigrants would be another example where it's just too clearly important and central to the character of our society. It can't be hidden any longer and Making Contact was one of the media outlets nationwide that pushed these concerns directly into the mainstream really. Even to this day, uh, to a great deal, the mainstream media focuses on the pundit class, the expert class, people from within government, people who used to be in government. At best, when they get outside of these official circles, they're talking to academics. The real big political story this week was the, a significant setback for the White House on the health care law. Frankly, I see no reason or no purpose ever that we need to raise marginal tax rates in this country. First in off, fact. your reaction to where Iraq is right now. The challenge is not to stop the violence from escalating. The challenge is to defeat Al Qaeda. People are just afraid to speak out on these uh, these gender identity issues. What absolutely did contribute to the disaster is the intense environmental movement which has prevented much shallow water drilling. Migrants, they call them, that have come across as well. And most of them are just released to go where they want to. And back the and forth and back and forth. The recidivism is, is beyond the pale. The president has been a little Michael Corleone towards the Republicans in the negotiations with Boehner in that sense. They rarely talk to actual grassroots activists, people who are actually organizing to accomplish their vision of a better world. You know, we hear a lot about poor people sometimes in our media. We rarely hear from poor people. We may hear about prisons and prisoners. We rarely hear from the families of prisoners or prisoners themselves. And those kind of stories that do allow us to break through those arbitrary walls that seal off us from each other Making contact makes it possible for us to make contact and to hear and to learn from each other and also to organize on that basis. Please listen carefully. Special thanks to Luna Olivaria Gallegos for her help on this show and to all our volunteers, interns, and staff over the past 20 years. As always, you can find podcasts, download shows from our archives, and help support our work at radioproject.org. Our Facebook and Twitter handle is making underscore contact. Thanks for 20 years of listening to Making Contact. For 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 Making Contact. For
You are listening to KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned for Hard Knock Radio. One, two, three, four. Y'all ready for this? 